So why don't we start kind of where we left off yesterday. We were talking about the different phases of throwing, the, the Job phases of throwing. Uh, <clears throat> and then when we went to uh, actually a video, <clears throat> we, can, we can see the, the, the different phases here we went through. And what we found is that the key point in terms of injury for the shoulder is the late cocking phase, which is right here. And we talked about getting a position, and that position is really critical for being able to throw a Major League Baseball fastball. And uh, most people who start pitching in their late teens would never would never be able to have the changes to really be able to do that and therefore have a chance for being have a Major League career. And this has been looked at. This is a, sl so a slide from Orlimpus Fasti from Curlin Job. Uh, where he did his study looking at the changes. Uh, and so what you really have is a Major League Baseball player on their <clears throat> side where they're throwing, they have a change in their arc of rotation uh, where they get more, <clears throat> they're able to reach back farther. Uh, but when they follow through, they tend to not to be able to follow through as far. So the, the total arc stays roughly the same, but it shifts. And the shifts allow the Major League Baseball pitcher to have more arc where he can put momentum on the ball, so therefore he can throw a faster ball before the release point. And looking at what causes this, some people think it's soft tissue changes. Uh, and here just uh, where they looked at the throwing side and the non-throwing side to show that there's a shift between the, the non-dominant and the dominant side. That just uh, shows that. So the, the some people believe that it may be due to soft tissue things. Uh, so some people believe that these changes are due to stretching of the anterior capsule, which could produce some instability anteriorly. Other people, Morgan, uh, these are two people who, uh, big name orthopedic surgeons who kind of battled things out, thought you got thick, thickening of the posterior capsule with retraction of the posterior capsule, which caused this kind of a shift. <clears throat> Looking carefully at osseous changes, it turns out there are, there are actually changes in the humerus, uh, which al allows a lot of this to happen. And it's called uh, a humeral and glenoid retroversion. So both the glenoid and the humeral bones adapt to allow you to have a, uh, uh, the arm to go back more posteriorly. And uh, this is just looking at it. I don't want to go through all these things. Basically, this has been looked at. Um, and... Uh, and essentially right now it's believed that there really aren't any capsular uh, contraction. What happens is actually a change in the anatomy, and this change in the anatomy uh, allows you to get back into that position where you have a little bit more rotation of the humeral head. And actually there's a slide here in a minute to show that these changes occur from about age 13 to 15. So it's really critical if you want to be a Major League Baseball pitcher that you really thought to start the pitching process in the early teens, uh, and that allows adaptation so that the throwing arm can actually have the right anatomy to be able to throw a Major League Baseball pitch. Now, associated with this uh, is called glenoid internal rotation deficit, and that means when you come forward with the shoulder, uh, uh, with the arm in rotation, uh, you don't rotate as much forward uh, as, and you get pain uh, with uh, this decrease in rotation, and it's called GERD, or glenoid internal rotation deficit. And this is what uh, Morgan thought was due to thickening the posterior capsule. Uh, Job thought was due to uh, laxity of the, of the anterior capsule. <clears throat> uh, it turns out, and, 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 and Morgan thought that this was fixed due to posterior capsule thickening, and he needed to treat it by doing active stretching. Now, it's actually looking carefully at these players, it turns out that this occurs right after pitching, but after the, the uh, pitchers rest for about three days, it goes away. So now it's really thought to be more of a natural defense against the throwing mechanism. And the best treatment for this is to decrease the amount of pitching and, and not do a lot of stretching and so forth, which was found not to be terribly useful. So what's happened, if you look at uh, uh, the number of complete games pitched, it peaked around 1971. Uh, in Major League Baseball, and we've had a steady decline since then to where it's extremely rare that pitchers in this day and age will pitch a complete game. 
Uh, and that's because pictures are very valuable. As you know, these guys make uh, uh, millions of dollars, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, therefore, uh, they're very valuable to these teams. And there's a lot of data now showing that uh, the too much pitching decreases uh, their life expectancy in major leagues and uh, therefore costs the team's money. So there are now a lot of restrictions that are placed on the amount of pitching, and you'll find most pitchers will only pitch in about the, the fifth or the sixth inning now, starting pitchers. Uh, and that's because if they do more than that, they start to fatigue, and they start getting injuries, a lot of which are career-ending injuries. So uh, things have become much more sophisticated now in managing these. Now, one of the injuries that can occur with this is called posterior impingement. So I want to spend some time talking about this. What you get with posterior impingement on an MR, you get fraying of the undersurface of the posterior supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons. I'll show this in a minute. You get cystic changes in the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. This is the same location where you get hill sac impaction injuries. It's the same location where you get avulsion injuries from the infraspinatus insertion. So, so this can masquerade as other things, and of course, posterior impingement only occurs in high-level throwing athletes. So there are a lot of other things which can cause injury in this location. And then you tend to get a posterior superior labral injury, which is fairly specific to this uh, mechanism. Uh, so what can this look like? Uh, this is actually in the Aber view, where the patient is skinned uh, with their, their, their arm up, at their, up their, at their side, and external rotation. What we can see here is this impaction injury of the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. Uh, <clears throat> we get fraying of the uh, rotator cuff where it attaches to the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. Uh, in other images, I'll show a labral tear associated with this. This patient also has a loose body, which is pretty uncommonly seen in this entity. Uh, so here's a 14-year-old baseball catcher with too much history of shoulder pain. And these injuries tend to occur in catchers and pitchers because they're the ones that really have uh, these frequent uh, hard throws, the catcher to third uh, to second base, uh, the pitcher obviously to home plate. So uh, Dan, what do you think of this case? So we got two, it looks like a arthrogram of the shoulder, PD fat sat, or T1 fat sat, I'm not sure. Um, PD fat sat. Um, uh, it looks like the posterior superior labrum, there is like a tear, or just, or just a posterior labrum. There's like a signal that goes, uh, it's like a non-displaced tear. And uh, I'm trying to see, there is like a, I'm not sure it's like a little edema, a, a hill sac, yeah, deformity. A little bit of edema here. Yeah. And we have a little, a little separation now. It's debated. But um, most people believe that it's normal, or at least not clinically significant, to have fluid going uh, underneath the, the base of the superior labrum. Uh, you do not see this in young kids. It's commonly seen in adults. So some people feel that it's a minor injury of no clinical significance. Uh, it, it really shouldn't be called a clinically significant slap tear. We'll talk more about slap tears when we get to the instability section. Uh, but certainly posteriorly, you should not see this. And certainly at the, at the equator of the glenoid, inferiorly, you, you shouldn't see fluid going deep to the labrum. The, the labrum should, be, uh, should have a watertight seal to the articular cartilage in this location. So this is abnormal. And uh, if we go to the coronal images, we can see that there's some fraying of the supraspinatus tendon, a little bit of irregularity of the posterior superior labrum there. You can see there, and this is this is early posterior impingement. Now, uh, this is a teenage baseball pitcher. Here we can see bony abnormality in that typical location. This would be where you would see a hill sac impaction injury, but this patient has no history of an anterior dislocation. This you can also see is at the insertion of the infraspinatus uh, tendon and just just superior to the insertion of the teres minor tendon. So there could be avulsive tear injuries things there, uh, which we commonly see in all adults, as you know. But if you also look at this, we have a posterior superior labral tear with a lot of blunting and abnormal increased signal intensity within the posterior superior labrum. And this was a baseball pitcher. Uh, so this is actually early posterior impingement. Now, you, where these occur, 
from this mechanism. When you put your arm in that cocked position, what happens is you get an impaction between the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head and the posterior superior uh, glenoid labrum. So when you cock it like that, you impact the bones in that location, and that's the cause of this injury. Now, along with this, you can pinch the, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons, or when you do that abruptly, what happens is you, you introduce a strain injury to the supra-infraspinatus attachment to the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity, and that produces this fraying here if you do it repetitively over and over again. So this is basically an overuse injury, and those three things are characteristic of this condition. Bony impaction injury, fraying of the rotator cuff, and a posterior superior labral tear. So here are examples that are relatively subtle and, and uh, early players. Here's the young teenage baseball players where we see that same thing. And there's the, this is the abnormal posterior superior labrum. Notice it's, it's uh, markedly blunted, has increased signal intensity, looks very different from the normal anterior labrum here. And we can see the tear at the base of the posterior and posterior superior labrum. So this is early impingement. Uh, Jeff, have you joined us? No? Okay. Dan, what do you think of this case? It looks like another orthogram. Um, axial, I think, is a T1? Or T1? T1. I'm not sure it's a T1 fat set. T1. And then there's a PD fat set. Um, uh, looks like there is um, abnormal, like, posterior labrum. I mean, I see the anti maybe anterior labrum is kind of like yeah, posterior labrum is kind of like blunted. And then also on the, um, the humeral head and the posterior kind of like lateral aspect, there is like a defect. Um, it's like a heel sac. And then also on the coronal image, there is some fraying of the undersurface fraying of the supraspinatus. It's partial thickness tear. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Or internal. Another word for it is internal impingement. So here we can see that typical impaction injury. It's at the same place, so it's a completely different mechanism than a hill sacs injury. Uh, it's also right at the insertion of the infra and teres minor tendons, really more the infraspinatus, which is higher up. Uh, so this is also an area where you can get traction injuries that are very common. So this is. These, those are the three things which typically occur in this location. So you have to look at the other constellation of findings to make a diagnosis. We can see that there is a tear of the superior labrum. That's uh, not normal, which goes back into the posterior labrum. We know that this is a major league baseball pitcher. And we have fraying of the rotator cuff. <clears throat> so these are the characteristic findings that we see in, uh, in posterior impingement. Uh, now... Now let me just see. Yeah, this is, I believe, a year later. No, wait a second. Let me let me just check here. I want to make sure that I got this correct. No. Okay. So uh, here's a, another Major League Baseball uh, player, uh, and here again we can see the uh, bony abnormalities. Uh, typical of a repetitive trauma and the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. In this particular case, we see some blunting, but we don't actually see a definite tear of the posterior labrum, though it's a little bit thick in there. And then if we do the Aber view, we can see a little bit of signal abnormality of the posterior superior labrum, but it's really not uh, significant. Uh, okay. So let, let, now let's go on to this case. This is a little bit more instructive. Uh, Jeff, what do you think, what do you see in this case? Okay, so we have a coronal T1 and T2, and it looks like at the uh, <coughs> um, supraspinatus, looks like at, there's a uh, articular side of partial tear of the supraspinatus at the footprint yeah, uh, with some subcontrosis formation. We see a tear of that inferior 
surface of the supraspinatus tendon. This is actually a little bit posterior supraspinatus tendon, a little overlap of the infraspinatus fibers. Okay, what else do you see? Uh, subchondral cyst formation. Uh, at the f and, uh, back here. Looks like a, yeah, there might be, even, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, and there's the bone injury. Uh, and this is more severe internal impingement or posterior impingement uh, from this particular mechanism. In this case, I, I'm not showing the, the labrum. <clears throat> uh, here's, uh, yes, John. All right. Uh, Jeff, uh, you, you said that's a T2. Uh, actually, that's a fat set. Right. Thank you. Yeah, this is a proton density fat set, not really a T2. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Actually, thank you. this one is actually a T2 on the left. Uh, we can see the fluid is bright, and this is a proton density fat suppressed here. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a T1. Excuse me, this is T1 because this is an arthrogram, and this is a proton density fat suppressed sequence. Yeah. Uh, you can't always fool orthopedic surgeons, you know. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, uh, uh, Dashali, what do you think of this case? We have two axial PD fat set images uh, of the shoulder. There's a large fluid collection posterior to the glenoid, uh, which represents a paralabral cyst. There's a remodeling of the posterior glenoid with subchondral cystic changes in ubernation and marginal osteophyte formation. And then the infraspinatus uh, tendon is a little bit irregular. We don't see the whole of the, the entirety of the tendon, but it does look irregular. Obviously, the labrum is torn back here. Yeah. And there's a cyst. And then here we see a cyst. So, uh, so what else do you see here? On the sagittal image. Yes. I I can't see your uh, uh, your mouse. So um, the uh, so there's another so there's a cyst there and it's um, just inferior to the um, uh, posterior aspect of the uh, spinous process of the scapula. So what would you be concerned about here? So I would be concerned for the cystic lesion, uh, which is likely a paralabral cyst given the labral tear, uh, resulting in mass effect upon the nerve. Okay. and resulting um, derivation you, injury. If there's some signal intensity change of this infraspinatus muscle, it's a little more edematous right. compared to the rest of the muscle. And what nerve would you be concerned about here? The uh, sub subscapular nerve? Yeah. And then here, if we go to the oblique coronal image, we can see the edema pattern within the subscapularis uh, 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 muscle here. So, uh, so you can get cysts in really kind of two locations here. If the cyst is higher up, uh, it, <clears throat> it will actually catch the nerve where you'll often get denervation changes of both supraspinatus and the teres minor. Uh, when it's more inferior here, uh, we you tend to just get primarily the nerve, the more distal nerve, going into the infraspinatus muscle. So these are paralabral cysts. And these are fairly common in baseball pitchers because this posterior superior labral tear you get, you get these paralabral cysts which can dissect into either the supraspinatus or uh, subscapularis notches uh, where they can uh, then compress the nerve and produce changes of denervation. We'll come back to this in a minute. But you always need to look for this uh, in pitchers, especially if they present with weakness and, and pain. Uh, see, Dan, what do you think of this case? It looks like we got a two images of coronal PD, or I should, maybe, I'm not sure, is it PD or T1, and a T2, T T2 and a PD fat sat. Um, again, we see a lot of, it looks like, cystic structures uh, from arising from superior, superior labrum, um, which extend to the to suprascapular notch from the posterior labrum. So this is and this is, so if you have a cyst there, you're worried about the innervation of both supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle bellies. Um, and it looks like there is increased signal at least on the supra and then also an infra. So, so. Both the infraspinatus and supraspinatus muscles. And there's the cyst. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> now, other things which can occur in baseball pitchers, this is a little bit of a younger pitcher. What we can see here are subchondral changes uh, involving the glenoid. Even though the articular cartilage looks intact overlying it, uh, and on the coronal images we can see these subchondral cystic changes. This comes from chronic repetitive trauma and impaction injury to the glenoid, and this can also uh, cause symptoms within shoulders. It's not in, uh, internal impingement, but it's an overuse syndrome where you really get subchondral bone injuries of the glenoid itself, and that's on the differential uh, diagnosis of, of evaluating. Uh, these players who end up uh, basically having decreased velocity. Some people, this is one of the causes of the so-called dead arm syndrome, uh, where they, they actually produce pain uh, that often the, the, the players will try to ignore, but the, the body protects itself by decreasing the strength of the muscle contractions and probably a reflex loop. Uh, let's see. Jeff, what do you think of this case? This was a Major League Baseball player a number of years ago for the Angels, which was their their really key uh, reliever uh, a number uh, several years ago. So he came in at the uh, stage with uh, so-called so a dead arm where he just couldn't throw. Okay, so this is a P uh, is a proton density fat size arthrogram. Yeah. Uh, so so what's apparent to me it looks like uh, that the uh, posterior labrum. Uh, I don't, I don't see the posterior labrum at all on there, and I uh, do see. Here's the labrum. I, There's the labrum. Oh, that's the labrum. Uh, okay, uh, the labrum actually. So, uh, it is actually detached. Uh, so it's torn. Uh, and it, it's the, from the glenoid. The labral attachment is markedly thickened here, and there's marked increased signal intensity within the labrum. Okay, mm. good. And what else do you see? Uh, I see uh, certainly some, uh, this significant uh, marrow changes within the humor, uh, posterior humor head. It looks like uh, if you're at the right level, this might represent uh, a defect or uh, posterior laterally uh, uh, hill stack deformity. Well, again, but, uh, the, we, might, we might be a little too low for that, actually. Well, this yeah. is the correct location for hill stacks, but don't call it a hill stack. Because yeah. hill stack okay. specifically means an impaction injury here from an anterior dislocation. So if you say okay. it's Hill Sachs, you're going to mislead the clinician into the wrong diagnosis. Uh, this, okay. this is internal or po uh, posterior impingement, depending upon what term uh, your clinicians use. And the other thing you see here is marked fraying and irregularity of the rotator cuff back in this location. And if you remember, those are the three things that we said are typical of posterior or internal impingement. So, this, uh, so there's the bone injury. There's the posterior labral tear. Uh, now, so this is on 10-8-2007, so this was uh, at the end of the season, and then uh, this is the next year, beginning of the season, uh, the same uh, patient after being off for uh, <clears throat> the off season. So what do you see now? He came back, started pitching again, and his shoulders started hurting again. <laughs> so I still see the, the, the posterior label tear uh, is unchanged. Uh, and uh, there is some improvement in the marrow edema, although I do see that certainly there's a significant defect right. uh, in the posterolateral humeral head. Uh, so and the, the cuff looks a little bit more uh, less frayed than on the prior study, though there's probably a little bit of insertional disease here. So but basically, uh -huh. he, he still has <clears throat> a lot of the abnormal anatomy for posterior impingement, and he certainly still has this large displaced uh, posterior labral tear. So this is his sagittal image. Now, at th this time he is complaining of some weakness. <clears throat> okay, so what I've, okay, so first of all, uh, it looks like, uh, so it looks like it on this, I do see the, uh, what I believe is the infraspinatus appears to be significantly atrophied uh, right there. And with relative, so, and then there's apparently, it looks like a, at least anteriorly, uh, it could be a significant uh, subscapulous recess uh, synovitis well, or edema uh, versus, uh, actually, I think it's actually what it is, I think it's, uh, it's it, I think actually the subscapularis muscle itself is uh, 
there's some kind of edema with it. Uh, yep. So maybe there's a denervation. The, the, this is the subscapularis muscle. Uh, okay. Not out for enough for the tendon. This is just joint fluid, fluid within the joint okay. where there's an effusion. Supraspinatus is large. Teres minor is large, but as you said, the uh, yeah. supraspinatus is severely atrophied. And, uh, so there's a, yeah, selective, uh, I'm wondering if there's some compression injury of the uh, suprascapular nerve. Yeah. Um, so so, so yeah. he has chronic nerve injury, uh, but yeah. he's really compensated for it by hypertrophy of the other muscles. Uh, but he's unable to pitch now, and we still see that he has that uh, uh, displaced uh, labrum. Um, most of the... Uh, uh, surgeons he went to see said that there really wasn't much to be done because the results of labral surgery in high-end pitchers like this uh, has not been very successful. Uh, but he went back to the East Coast and actually had surgery. And then the next season tried to come back and pitch, did fine for a couple of days, then felt a pop and had pain in his shoulder again. So what's happened here? All right. So we have, uh, again, Proton density uh, images, chronal and axial, uh, with an arthrogram demonstrating. Uh, looks like I do see. These are huh? T1 weighted images with arthrogram. These are T1. Thank you. Uh, so there are post surgical changes uh, in the uh, posterior glenoid, uh, and it looks like uh, there's been reoccurrence or re tear of the posterior labrum. Right. So here are the three suture anchors where they did to tack down the posterior labrum, but when he started pitching again, he retore the labrum. Notice that his, his his tendon looks pretty nice and smooth here. Uh, we don't we're not actually quite high enough here to see uh, the bone injury, but uh, he had a recurrent tear, and at this point he retired from baseball. So so this is kind of the more end stage version of posterior impingement uh, in, in these overhead throwing players. So do you have any question about impingement syndromes? Yes. So this infraspinatus muscle atrophy, was infraspinatus muscle atrophy related to that partial thickness tear of the infraspinatus tendon, or was it primarily from some paralabral cyst going in the spinal glenoid notched and caused denervation? I don't know in this particular individual, but uh, I'm only really aware of the paralabral cysts really causing chronic uh, nerve damage. And we know that once you get atrophy from nerve damage of a muscle, even even if you get a functioning of the nerve back, the muscle tends not to come back. So my guess is he probably had a paralabral cyst in the early days when he had the labral tear. When the tear got larger, it just decompressed into the joint space. So we no longer saw the paralabral cyst, but he was left with the atrophy of the infraspinatus. And my guess, the infraspinatus uh, muscle atrophied several years earlier. And he was still able to pitch at the major league level, even when he probably had atrophy of the infraspinatus. Uh, but he overcame it by hypertrophying the other muscles. But the, the thing is, it's still the, the rotator cuff is interfered with. And um, as you said, John, uh, these high-level pitchers, they need everything right. uh, to get 90 or 100 mile an hour pitches. Uh, frankly, I, I, I didn't mention anything because I... Uh, I haven't said anything about pitching, but uh, pitchers that, are high, uh, that become uh, high-class pitchers are, are um, and I'll use not a PC word, they're kind of uh, freaks of nature. Uh, very few people can do uh, pitching to this level. Uh, you see a lot of baseball players, but they, they, they can throw a ball. But, uh, uh, there's a big difference between a pitcher throwing a ball and an outfielder uh, in terms of speed and, 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 and accuracy. So anyway, um, just because you're 11 uh, years old and you start pitching uh, and, and hope to get a scholarship in, in, in some university, uh, unless you're born with an anatomy adequate for this kind of a activity, you're not going to make it. Uh, and that, you can catch that pretty early in life. Okay. Either you <laughs> have or you don't. <laughs> Dr. Cruz? Yes. The, the glenoid on that image, it doesn't look significantly retroverted. 
Um, and or maybe it is. Would you say that it was significantly retroverted? Yeah, I. Uh, these may not be the best images to show it. And it may be a little bit subtle. Uh, uh, I think there was a mild degree, but very mild retroversion of the glenoid in this particular case. Okay. Okay. Did I miss something about that? Uh, there's some significance to the retroversion of the glenoid uh, yeah, in it, your pathology. Yeah. What typically what we were said is that in order for major league baseball pitchers to get their arm in the proper uh, uh, late cocking stage. You actually have to have bony changes to the humerus and to the glenoid, where the, the two sides are no longer symmetric, and you tend to get more of a retroversion of the glenoid, and you get kind of a rotation of the humeral head. That allows you to get in the extreme cocking position, which gives you more arc to put power on the ball, and this only occurs on the throwing side of, of these pitchers, not on the non-throwing side. So it's really anatomic changes which allows them to get in to be able to throw these kind of fastballs, and that occur and that oh, those anatomic changes occur in the early teens. Uh, John. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, this kind of goes against Wolf's law, so I wonder how accurate these guys are. Uh, you know, I didn't really check directly into their methods. Uh, I'll I'll talk to uh, the the person who did it. Olympus Vasti is someone we work with quite regularly. So uh, I'll ask him specifically about that the next time I see him. Yeah, I've met him, and uh, you know, to measure these things is extremely difficult, as you know. Yeah. I, I, I was thinking if you take the glenoid um, and draw a line from the glenoid to the a coracoid process, yeah. you might get a better idea of. Um, of uh, rotation, uh, I, I'm just throwing that out for well, for consideration. I think somewhere in these talks, I have uh, show how we measure uh, retroversion of the glenoid. I think it's one of the other talks. Uh, we need a little bit larger field of view. This is combed down too much. You have to draw a line. You have to take the axial image right through the mid uh, glenoid. You have to see the entire uh, scapula and draw a line along the scapula through the mid portion of the glenoid. And then you need to draw a line from the uh, uh, lateral margin of the anterior glenoid through the lateral margin of the posterior glenoid. And then you produce, you get an angle between those two. And uh, uh, depending upon that angle, uh, you can determine whether there is anti uh, retroversion or antiversion. But I'm pretty sure I've got uh, 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 a slide on this in one of the future talks uh, that goes through what numbers are considered anti and what numbers are concerned, considered retro. I'm uh, sure you do, because I remember that. Yeah, and, and I think they measured it. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't remember the details of, of their study at this point, but they felt that they could see a, a change in the two sides which occurred in the early teens. But I'll, I'll find out more information the next time I see him. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to quit out of this now. And.